Hey, what's up, world? It's Patrick Lovell, truth bomb riffing at you, to you, with you on Thursday, August 15th at approximately 1.20 p.m. my time. Beautiful day in my neck of the woods, and uh, I just got done with a workout, and I'm working on this incredible project that my colleagues and I are putting together for you and hopefully millions of others like you out there. Um, that's going to be our website, and it's called Patrick Lovell Presents the Clean New Deal which is going to be amazing. And I'm so excited about it, but um, there's just these crazy epiphanies that are happening like left and right that are relevant that, you know, I want to share with those of you who I can get this information to. And I'm pretty relaxed. As you can see, I don't really care what I look like, but, um, and I really don't care what people think, to be honest with you, because that's what happens when you have the information that can change the world. I frequently say, when you have the truth, you're bulletproof. And it's true. I don't care if I get knocked off tomorrow. What I've done and the work that I have and what I've been able to do for the American people is like nothing that's happened in our lifetime. And I know that sounds highfalutin. I think it might sound a little bit, uh, you know, what do, what do people like to say, delusional? But those are people who don't know what I've done. And those are people who have no idea who I am and where I've come from and what it means. But I do. <laughs> so that's why this effort is called Patrick Lovell Presents the Clean New Deal. Because unfortunately, even though I'm definitely uh, connected to some wonderful people, uh, one in particular that's been lock and step, step with me the whole time that we've been trying to attempt to get your attention, uh, but unfortunately, or fortunately, however you, 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 you shape it up, I did the work, so I understand what it all means. And so let's kind of give you a snapshot of what's happening today, again, on Thursday, August 15th, uh, at approximately 1.30 p.m. my time. And of course, it's the year 2024, which always blows my mind when I think about it. But um, we're literally less than three months away to this incredible election that's going to have a lot of our attention and is going to create just incredible furtherment of disinformation and misinformation and confusion about what it is we are and what we're dealing with and how it all works. And that's what I'm trying to convey to you as I deal with distractions and other things that are just daily life occurrences. But um, let's consider what we're looking at today. And I'm going to hopefully try to piece a lot of these things that are in my mind. So really, as of this this moment, I think what happened earlier today um, that could be considered news is President Biden showed up on the campaign stump with vice president and to be nominated of the Democratic Party on the presidential ticket. Kamala, Kamala, as I've been um, taught to pronounce her name, it sounds like Kamala, Kamala Harris is the appropriate pronunciation, of course, her VP pick, uh, Governor of Minnesota, Tim Walz, um, as they go through, you know, the fire, if as it were, uh, in the midst of this really incredible insanity and stupidity of all things Donald Trump and what the MAGA, MAGA zombie apocalypse is in the context of Trump contagion versus what our system is supposed to be. So, for example... The way this whole thing is being kind of constructed and framed is this going to be the prosecutor, Ms. Kamala Harris, that was at one point the AG of California. And if you don't know what that abbreviation means, it means Attorney General of California. And, um, you know, she's supposedly prosecuted, you know, drug dealers and sex offenders and frauds and won over big, uh, you know, settlements with the banks. And she's on the good side of things. And, you know, she's obviously for many of us, and I, I put myself in this category as well, relatively enthusiastic given just the monstrosity of all things Trump. Um, but again, somewhat problematic, but at the same time, Tim Walsh is not a part of the problem, nor has he ever been. And he is actually the perfect guy, quite frankly, which I think was a bit of a miscalculation, but the ultimate in calculation, former Attorney General of the United States, Eric Holder, who was the Attorney General under then President Barack Obama, 
who was pretty responsible for pretty much everything that I'm revealing to you, that obviously I have enough confidence to appear and speak slowly and softly and in a way that I'm going to try to matriculate my thoughts in a compelling way because I have the information that can take down the largest criminal racketeering enterprise in the history of the world. And I know that's saying something, <laughs> but it's true. So let's just consider for a second, and I didn't watch, and I'll, I'll probably watch it after this or sometime today between all the work that I'm doing, but I'll probably watch the uh, uh, sound bites or clips, and maybe I'll try to find the entire entirety of um, Biden appearing with Kamala and, you know, seeing what he had to say and how they said it. It's going to be a rah-rah fast, of course. There's not going to be any details. It's going to be us versus them. We're the good guys and we're not them because we project things of normalcy. You know, I, I've said it before that Ms. Kamala Harris um, projects this really intellectual uh, dynamo, uh, this multi uh, ethnic, if you will, um, you know, wonderful human being that's a woman that's extremely important because of all things Trump. And um, of course, smart and part of the system, right? And someone that we can trust to helm the system, I suppose. And the idea is that, you know, this is the fight of our lives for democracy. Because of course, Trump is a train wreck, embodiment reflection of who we are and what we're all about quite frankly i mean i almost consider trump a uh, kind of like a uh like it, I, I know it's going to sound ironic and kind of crazy but i i kind of feel like in the ethereal sense you know not, don't take me literal in this translation but in the ethereal sense he almost seems god-given from this perspective that it's like he's the ultimate reflection of the system that I'm trying to and tenaciously and insanely trying to reveal to you, and I have been for now over two years on these truth bomb riffs, the red carpet reflection of what our system is. And Donald Trump is a criminal. He's been a con for four decades. He should have been in prison four decades ago. I've got the full story and evidence, and I work with one of the, I don't work with, I, I interact with one of the world's foremost ex experts in all things Donald Trump. And if you look into my truth bombs, you'll see that I've had several interviews with a gentleman by the name of David K. Johnston. And, uh, you know, he's revealed elements of fraud that should have been convicted by a prosecutor doing his or her job long ago that would have prevented any of this from happening. But of course they didn't. And why didn't they? <laughs> well, because it was difficult from the standpoint that, yeah, Donald Trump has always had money so he could always hire attorneys. And what it's turned out is he doesn't hire the best of the attorneys. He doesn't even hire like B-level attorneys. He hires like D-minus attorneys. And that goes for accountants as well. You can jam things up, you know, a little bit uh, in the court system, but he hired because he's so cheap. He hires idiots, and any really significant prosecutor worth his or her weight uh, in terms of what their salary was, I'm sure I could have done it. Put together the discovery of the uh, case to be able to bring an arraignment, indictment, and ultimately conviction, particularly in front of a jury, a grand jury, as we saw in the 34 convictions that Donald Trump obviously was found guilty of um, in the uh, Southern District of Manhattan, led by attorney, or I should say, District Attorney Alvin Bragg of New York City. And good on you, New York City. You're the only guys that have actually done anything to bring any merit of consequence and accountability to a man who's never had it his entire life. And in the midst of that, you know, and I, and I will also compliment Letitia James, of course, the, the uh, New York Attorney General, who also got a conviction based on the civil fraud trial of deceiving banks. 
<laughs> which is another part of my story, which of course led to Donald Trump supposedly supposedly having to pay a fine of $450 million that could have bankrupted him. That led to a pretty much a, uh, what we call a death penalty for his businesses operating in New York for three years. That's the penalty, um, which is significant. But, you know, since then, I mean, I, I think that, you know, based on what, you know, New York was going to be able to take in terms of collateral to be able to kind of push things off in terms of judgments. And Trump was dealing with, of all things, a, a subprime lender who specializes in in cars in Southern California was somebody who was going to come up with, I think, 175 million, but I think they staved it off long enough for him to kind of go through what's going on while everybody else is focusing on the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Right. And that's part and parcel of this whole situation. And um, meanwhile, two days ago, we saw the mother of all, are you kidding me? What the fucks? In this sort of impromptu interview, with CEO of Tesla and SpaceX and everybody's favorite billionaire from South Africa, Elon Musk, who of course supposedly owns Tesla and however that's supposed to work. And I've said to those of you who are paying attention over and over that, you know, he didn't just reach into his bank account and pull out the $34 billion to buy te uh, Twitter from Jack Dorsey he financed it and he financed it with groups of private equity that may or may not be tied to one of the largest private equity groups in the country by the name of Blackstone and their CEO, Stephen Schwartzman is putting a lot of money into Donald Trump's campaign, for example, and also Saudi Arabia and their sovereign wealth fund was involved with Tesla or Tesla was involved with uh, Twitter prior to um, Elon purchasing it. But yeah, I mean, in the small world of ultra, ultra billionaires and billionaire apparatuses that construct, construe the top 001% globally, yeah, they're they're all kind of in the same sandbox. And this interview went on for two hours that just exposed, quite frankly, both how maniacal and, and quite literally how stupid Elon Musk is. The questions, the approach, what, what Elon did was just humiliated himself. He he reminded me of a poodle humping Trump's leg. It was like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And what else are you going to do? And all of these different things, which ultimately manifested into a discussion of hyperbolic lies. And again, that mirrors and manifests everything that Elon is all about and what I'm in the midst of and actually what I'm challenging Elon about, because I happen to get ejected from X because last week there was an incident that involved vice president candidate on the Republican side, J.D. Vance, where there was this video circulating of him on the tarmac with his Secret Service and apparently Vice President Kamala, 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 Kamala Harris, her plane, you know, which is uh, Air Force Two, because she's the vice president of the United States. They were in Wisconsin, both for uh, campaign events. And the imagery was that J.D. Vance was approaching and looking like wandering around in circles on the tarmac, how he was going to lead he and his what appear to be this guerrilla staff of security guards, right, that are probably the, uh, you know, uh, I I don't know what part of the service they're they're part of. I they, they may have been private security because he's no, they would have to have been uh because he is actual on the presidential ticket of one of the two primary, I mean parties. So it might have been secret service. But in either case, they just look like goons going to basically intimidate Vice President Harris. Now, of course, she's going to be surrounded by the same security guys, so it'd be kind of odd to say the least. And of course, JD Vance is odd to say the least. And uh, I just happened to respond on X. I said, listen, um, if that were me, I would have run to Mr. Vance and I would have given him exactly what he's looking, what he was asking for. Now, I didn't intend that to, I don't know, infer some sort of violent uh, rhetoric. If he would ask me for a glass of water, maybe I would have given him a glass of water. If he would have asked for directions, 
I would have given him directions. If he would have asked, you know, if I knew what time it was, I would have told him how, what time it was. So how X, and I, I call them the thought police, which is a um, call out uh, or callback, I should say, to, of course, Orwell's 1984, the thought police. Everything in Orwell is double speak and everything's a lie and everything's perverted and everything's up to, upside down to protect power. They use a psychological leverage to control populations, which is really what politics is in this age, this day and age. But, um, you know, that was my crime. And it set off red flags on Twitter immediately. Sorry, X. And of course, I got put into the holding tank, right? Uh, as if I would engaged in some sort of assault, when meanwhile, it was J.D. Vance projecting that he was on his way to engage in assault. And so basically, I was coming to the defense of Vice President Kamala Harris, which millions of you are doing at this very second, and millions of you who are actually doing that, particularly on X, have encountered many of the same weights of what we call thro being throttled down or actually branded as dangerous content if you're actually promoting positive imagery or campaign sloganeering or anything associated with being pro Kamala Harris. I actually witnessed uh, somebody who is a staunch advocate of the vice president and to her, uh, obviously her election is very enthusiastic about it. He had shared just simply a thumbnail meme of Vice President Harris looking very, you know, confident and capable and brilliant and beautiful. And it was, you know, equipped with some sort of declaration of Kamala to the rescue. Something just as benign as that. That wasn't exactly where it was, but it was it was benign like that. And when I saw it on my timeline, on my thread, it literally had said this post might have dangerous or inappropriate information as if it were like a neo-Nazi or maybe some sort of porn or it was like, it was literally a warning, you know, without being able to see it, but I clicked on it anyway. And then that's what they were trying to prevent me from clicking on, which is part of the algorithm, which goes to what I've been saying for a long time, that X is a platform of propaganda that amplifies intimidation and hatred and violent speech and rhetoric and lies and lies and lies and defamation and intimidation, I already said, and you know other elements that are not free speech. So again, Elon Musk is Orwell or a, a character in an Orwell plot, but it gets even better. Because I've been, and I've declared this for some time, but I've been a fan of Elon Musk for a long time. I don't know why I didn't know all of this stuff before, but I know more now because once he, I think this is about the third or fourth time that I have been censored on X because I'm critical of Elon Musk, but more importantly, because of the truths that I'm revealing and that I have that nobody else is going to reveal. That's going to come out full bore in our um, website but um, that are so relevant now to everything that's going on. And Elon Musk, um, I was hopeful that he was the right guy at the right time and we're about the same age. And he came kind of into being really on a national stage during what was one of the hardest time periods of my life and so many millions of our lives during the 2008 great financial crisis. And that's when he became, I mean, we all kind of knew about him a little bit on the periphery because of his engagement with uh, PayPal and being kind of a tech millionaire. He made 180 million, maybe 185 million on selling um, whatever his share. And I think they sold it to eBay, he and um, Peter Thiel, who's very important in this whole matrix as well. But they sold PayPal to eBay. And then Elon was able to roll that money over and get involved with Tesla. And what I learned was eventually he shoved out the two creators of Tesla, who were the genius engineers that pressed forward what could be done with a sports car and, you know, battery technology and all of these things right around the time that the global economy had come to a scratching halt based on the information that I have. That never ended, but that is our reality. But all of this stuff gave birth to ultimately 
who Elon was and is and what I am actually the ultimate threat to because I'm carrying the truth against the wall of lies that Elon continues to profess. Not only in a stupid interview with, with Donald Trump, the ultimate liar, I don't think he can speak without lying. I don't think he can breathe without lying. But Elon Musk is in that category because Elon Musk, we kind of believe the myth, the hype, that here's this kind of Steve Jobs-like innovator who came in to save the world to create this paradigm that enabled this electric car manufacturer to basically change the entirety of the platform and move electric um, technology forward, which he did in large degree. But he's not solely responsible for it, not by a long shot. But he did put all of his money in. He did take risk. But the risk was guaranteed by the subsidies of the United States government that also attracted the likes of Daimler Chrysler, which is Mercedes-Benz, the largest, one of the largest companies in the world, that got behind Tesla to help bring it to scale, to do all of the incredibly important things that traders, by the way, were shorting the whole time, but they were able to overcome it because the United States government wanted to see the electric car paradigm finally come to fruition because we had already had evolving technology for decades and decades, but it was time to turn, turn it on. And president Obama and one of the many things he actually did right was he was able to get the stimulus package through Congress after the great financial crisis that matched the money that we had to put in initially into what we called the troubled assets relief program to get liquidity into financial markets, which I'll address momentarily. But on the side of the ledger, as it relates to Elon Musk, it was massive subsidies and guarantees. And then, of course, tax policy. And then ultimately, a, to a bunch of financialization that would lead to the schemes that I touch upon in many of my truth bombs, which would lead you to understand that there was definitely scheming by way of uh, hyperinflating stock values on a number of different pieces of misinformation along the way. And this doesn't need to be a you know, expose or a treatise on all things Tesla and X, but more importantly, in terms of who Elon Musk is versus what the myth is, and Elon Musk isn't this sort of fountainhead character that created all of the technology, that brought it all to market, that sold all the investors, that ultimately changed the paradigm based on his own inclinations and vision. That's the myth. That's not the reality. Now, did he work in factories and, and, and sleep on couches and work around the clock and demand, you know, people that he had hired to be, you know, viciously committed to what it is that they do? And he only kept the best of the best and they were able to do a lot of amazing things. Yeah, that part is true. And did that create value for the company? Yeah, it certainly did. There's no question about it. But it was the matrix, if you will, of the system that once you commit capital, particularly through the sort of stimulus programs, and then you back it with government guarantees, what you do is you minimize the risk, which then brings in a lot of potential for growth. And thankfully so, because I think the world is better off that we have a renewable energy opportunity with electric cars. Maybe not everybody can afford $165,000 luxurious Tesla X like I'd like to be driving around and I still want to be driving around in as much as I despise Elon Musk. Um, maybe I got to reconcile that soon. Maybe there's something wrong with me as a result of that. But, you know, Elon is really a facade. But what's real are the things that I continue to point out to you about what makes him dangerous at this stage of the game. So, for example, the fact that he's gone all in on Trump a guy that we know lied 5,000 times plus in office and um, was involved with one engineering and, and gerrymandering and stealing and lying about the election in 2016 on a variety of fronts. But what we just saw him convicted of was, of course, creating fabrication of business documents to suppress the information that he worked in unison and conspiracy with none other than David Pecker of the National Enquirer to catch and kill and suppress the story of Stormy Daniels while making hush money payments. And then, of course, lying to the public, which is illegal in New York, uh, to win the election, to suppress the information. And he was found guilty on 34 counts that all emanated from lying, stealing, thieving, it, which 
in a nutshell, it's called deceptive acts and practices. Yeah, we have laws to prevent that from happening. But the only way they actually mean anything is if prosecutors do their job. Going back to what I said at the beginning of this, prosecutors had Donald Trump dead to rights on at least that I'm aware of, at least, I'm going to call it from the savings and loan era and the junk bond situation in Taj Mahal, payoffs to New Jersey officials, and then ultimately, you know, what were some of the other big ones? I mean, well, of course, we had Trump University, of which he was found guilty of, and that was his fraud. Uh, is selling all sorts of lies and deceptive acts and practices to people that thought they were going to get their money's worth because of his insight for Trump University through real estate. And he didn't teach all of the elements of his lying, stealing and deceiving. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been found guilty and had to pay $25 million. He tried to set it up as a legit deal, but there was all sorts of other aspects of it. But, you know, look, I think there's at least that I can count, again, is based on fabrication of business documents that go back in tax fraud and liabilities to both New York State and New Jersey and the city of New York and whatever counties he's in and also on the federal level. I mean, we're talking like six to 12 major, major criminal actions that could have been taken long before he ever became president of the United States. And here we did kind of a backfill, you know, ultimately based on the elements that were known in 26, 2006, let alone 2016. But they were known in two, but the prosecutors didn't bring the case. That's the fault of our legal system. And so the biggest, uh, you know, epiphany for any of you listening to this might be that, well, if you don't hold the bad, bad guys to account, and what else would you expect? Donald Trump, like any major criminal, especially that we see out of stories like in Batman and Gotham, are going to double down and triple down and quadruple down until someone stops them. And that's always been part and parcel to kind of what the law is all about in the United States. But many of the fights that we've had throughout the years, I mean, come on, we had the mafia and we had, you know, a, a lot of major players in the 40s and the 50s. Going back to the 20s, what am I talking about? Prohibition. Right. And all things in Chicago. And I can't think of, uh, of course, the Don in Chicago that comes to mind for tax evasion. But, you know, and that goes to this as well, because tax evasion is one of the easiest things you could have taken Trump out for years ago. But that never happened. So it just got worse and worse and worse and to the point where he just got bigger and bigger criminals to backstop him. And by the time you get to 2016, he's playing ball with, you know, Vladimir Putin and Vladimir Putin turns out after all the things he had to endure after being the head of the KGB and then surviving basically the bankruptcy of the Soviet Union care of a lot of the financialization that was the first rungs of what it is that I've been revealing to you this whole time, the long term capital management that bank bankrupted the Soviet Union because the ruble, uh, basically there was a run on a ruble and a collapse on their currency. That was kind of the felt, the final nail in the coffin of the Soviet Union, as it once was, which was our you know supposed enemy during the Cold War. But ultimately, you know, Trump and uh, and uh, Putin, you know, kind of find a way to break bread and some sort of aligned interests, so to speak. And I, I kind of have to ha hand it to him, even though I'm not a fan at all. Although I do respect him on occasion, but sometimes he's less crafty than I think he is, but because uh, Putin has shown some kind of vulnerabilities. Meanwhile, I think yesterday or even today, it looks like the Ukraine has actually penetrated Russian um, Russian territory. And I think even taken over a town on the on the uh, border. So that's kind of a big deal in the, in the grand nexus of the geopolitics part of what I reveal to you in context to why all of this stuff matters. But uh, yeah, so you ultimately have this just joke of a human being, which is Don the con, Chumpstein, Frankenstein, you know, the joke, joker, I should say, that manifested a hostile takeover of the corrupt Republican Party that had no legitimacy really since the Fox era anyway. And he becomes their guy. And, you know, he uh, not only lies 5,000 times while in office, gets impeached, but the Republicans are so weak and they don't care about the law that they presume to champion in law and order, which is just a lie. 
they let them get away with it because of the numbers of you know what they needed you know for votes in Congress. And so Trump doesn't get impeached, but ultimately you know he lowered taxes for billionaires and he wants to pull down the veil of you know deregulate. He wants to create more deregulation for all of the sinister villains behind the scenes. And maybe if he has any utility, it's that. But then he also had utility to the other side of the equation, which was these forces that I've mentioned over the course of time, which are, you know, something that's been with us really probably since the beginning of the United States and goes back through Western Europe throughout a millennium, but kind of the supremacy of, of the white race. And as I've mentioned on several occasions, Rachel Maddow recently um, revealed a fantastic podcast called Ultra, which ultimately reveals this nexus of white right wing conspiracies in the United States that had followed the Civil War through Jim Crow, through the John Birch Society, where wealthy, you know, white business people who want control of the government find a way to manifest control of the white masses so that they have all the control. I mean, that's one way of manipulating democracy or whatever other sort of form of government there may be. But in this particular case, Rachel Maddow laid out that, yeah, they were indeed not only what we knew in terms of like the American Confederacy and all of those elements that exist in the United States, but no, they were literally lockstep with the Nazis by way of material support. The Nazis literally provided finance, money, uh, resources, you know, intelligence, that sort of thing to help bring white, you know, shall we say allied useful idiots for their purposes to get in the highest levels of Congress. And yet, this is a step and repeat of that era, which led all the way through the McCarthy era, which was, I thought, part and parcel to the Red Square scare and all things the Cold War after the end of World War II. But as it turns out, it's, it was mostly about white supremacy, quite frankly, and how you materialize and you manipulate and, and, and you know, create a unified front, which is very effective in a democracy when you've got to move the majority to be able to back a situation which ultimately became a majority by the minority because it's not like they were all working to elevate the white working class. It was for white rich people to have complete control <laughs> through an oligarchy uh, that would then control all the white people that felt like LBJ revealed that if you can convince the lowest rung white guy that he's higher on the ladder than the highest rung black guy, you can pick, it's all, pick his pockets all day. Yeah, there's an, a long diabolical perverse history of this situation that's all about control, okay? And I'm smiling not because it's funny, it's just it never ends and it's ridiculous because this is what Elon Musk, the presumed innovator, you know, this self-made <clears throat> multi-billionaire proclaims, and then he's going to put all of his sort of political interests and his soul and his ideology into this supposed free speech platform <laughs> to back a racist criminal which might mean that's what he is. Well, in many ways, that's exactly what he is. And let's not mention, forget that he came from apartheid South Africa back in the day, and he's got a weird family history, and there's so much more to it. But the long and the short of it is, you know, Elon is worth 200 and let's call it $47 billion today, even though I think the company lost $150 billion the last couple of days because of just, I think, a lot of shareholders. Uh, being sick and tired of Elon, not to mention people are buying fewer and fewer Teslas, but they weren't buying a lot of Teslas during COVID. So how did he double and triple and quadruple his wealth at that time period? What I'm telling you about and why I'm calm and why I um, really don't care what people think um, in so much as I care to get this message to as many people as I possibly can. And the question is, do you want to live in truth in a democracy where the integrity of law is legit, where there are separation of powers, all of the elements of what the country was designed to do that we all know is never perfect, but 
should it be a fascist state where, and this is the ultimate question, this is the ultimate question. Do you think the framers who supposedly, and they did, defeated the greatest empire in the history of their era, the English empire, um, which was incredible, uh, their sacrifices and what they had to do, but to create a government supposedly of, by, and for the people through separation of powers, predicated on the principles of the Bill of Rights to create liberty and justice for all that would be um, protected by the Constitution, where no man or company is above the law. It's the idea. That's what we're all taught. That's what we're all led to believe. We all kind of have in the back of our minds. Is that what's going on? Are we going to save that? Well, that's, I mean, obviously, Kamala Harris is someone who fits that paradigm a lot closer than what I just laid out Elon Musk and Donald Trump do. So therefore, well, she's the obvious choice because she's everything that Donald Trump isn't, right? Well, yeah. Except for one very significant problem, aka inconvenient truth. Now, please understand when I make this iteration and this description of what I'm talking about, it's not remotely connected to Vice President Peck, Ten Walsh. No, he's legit. 25-year National Guard, regardless of what these idiots on the uh, Republican side who are trying to tar and feather him because he's because um, they're attacking his, they're attacking his, uh, you know, his, uh, what's it called, um, character and his, his you know, what he did, you know, for 25 years in service in the National Guard and that sort of thing, compared to what Donald Trump and his bone spurs and getting out of Vietnam and all the shit that he did in terms of like, you know, calling, you know, warriors that got, you know, captured by troops and you know, like John McCain, where they were tortured and everything else, losers. I mean, he would have the audacity to say that because he's such a disgusting human being that was born on third base because Papa Trump made millions and hundreds of millions of dollars based on extracting through basically socialism programs to basically exploit and predate on minorities. I mean, yeah, that was their business model from the beginning, not to mention that grandfather Trump, the guy that came from Germany, D capital R-U-M-P-H, I believe, was literally a pimp. Yeah, he was a pimp in the Yukon territories. Go figure, right? So these guys have a long history of, decept of deceptive acts and practices to develop cons, which made them a lot of money and led to Donald Trump being on third, born on third base and then everything that he's done throughout his career, which really the only valuable thing that Donald Trump ever brought, as far as I'm concerned, is the revelation that it's all fake media. Yeah, he manipulated it the whole time and he understands it. And so he basically laid out from his own sort of revelations, the emperor's new clothes, um, but in a grift way, right? Because the formula that Donald Trump has always basically projected is lie, deny, switch the blame and implicate. He's not the only one. It's a thing. <laughs> but it really works in real estate. OK, and I could go on and on and on. And I think I have mentioned in this particular truth bomb riff that, look, Donald Trump, you know, in the, you know, 34 indictment or sorry, criminal convictions that are felonies that each one has four years attached to it, that he should go to jail for a very significant amount of time to prison because it was a state situation would actually go to Rikers, which is the real deal, not some club fed sort of thing uh, you know and that's really what's on the line is he going to be sentenced to prison i i don't know is that the only case we're going to see yeah before the election because of Fonnie willis mucking it up with her own personal relationship with the guy that you know i mean she had a rico situation and then of course judge eileen cannon busting up you know uh the doj's uh jack smith investigation into stealing top secret information to sell to our enemies and we'll never see what that is at least unless maybe kamala wins but my gut tells me kamala is just going to try to put the whole thing to bed you know kind of like in a gerald ford sort of nixon way where it's like we didn't hold nixon accountable so maybe in some roundabout way that is why we're in the midst of what we are power basically protects itself but going back to kamala whether she's the knight 
on the white horse and she's all that because of the identity politics scenario. Yeah. You know, she is to a degree. And again, her vice president has nothing to do with being connected to anything that I'm telling you. He, he's a real deal. He was a high school teacher and a high school fo football coach. And he's exactly the guy that needs to champion what it is that I'm trying to get tens of millions of you to wrap your head around so that we can just ask this basic question because nobody in media is going to ask this question because media is bought by everything that I'm revealing to you. Do you think the framers of the constitution, the guys that won the revolution, the people that created the separation of powers to give in order to form a more perfect union, a chance through the bill of rights and the constitution, do you think that they'd envisioned the United States being engulfed by billionaires that would get free money from the full faith and credit of the United States for deceiving, betraying, destroying illegally, literally by the law, this isn't hyperbole, tens of millions of Americans using the same stuff that we're now seeing that Donald Trump was indicted for and convicted for, falsification of business records, the nature of deceptive acts and practices and racketeering and fraudul fraudulent signatures on documents, which is what Trump did in the racketeering scenario down in, in Georgia. At least that's what he was being indicted for, which means probable cause and most likely would have been convicted of that as well, not to mention his attorneys, which are part and parcel of this thing, because it's called failed state when corruption rules. When they know that there's not going to be any, any accountability Corruption rules. The bad guys get away with it. Imagine, and we've seen the movie a million times, what happens if Batman and Iron Man and Superman and Aquaman and all those guys, what if they just cave? What if they don't fight back to the bad guys? What happens? It's that elementary. What happens? The criminals take over. Okay, but to what ends? And what is anybody telling you? What, what are they not telling you that I am? in my preparation to try to get everybody to understand the clean new deal because Patrick Lovell presents the clean new deal. And who is Patrick, the guy who went the distance to discover and actualize the understanding of the mechanics, because I did what's known as discovery through my work, the con that you can find at www.thecon.tv, which is the blueprint for how this whole thing works, which is actually the investigation that our DOJ and our SEC which is the Securities and Exchange Commission and AGs around the country were paid not to do. So that Eric Holder, the former attorney general of, of Barack Obama, could do a sleight of hand, basically dog and pony trick show where ultimately he held the banks of this country, which we call too big to fail banks, responsible for about $250 billion in fines. And he basically, in all of these civil settlements, describe to you what I'm describing to you. But there wasn't a criminal conviction because they chose not to. Remember I mentioned, why wasn't Donald Trump held accountable? Well, because the prosecutor chose not to do the investigation to get the indictments, to take him through the judiciary and through the process to ultimately get him in front of a grand jury to get a conviction. That's what the law is supposed to do in a country that was created to basically never allow tyranny to rule. That's the whole idea of America. That was the whole idea of not just the revolution, but also the civil war and the civil rights movement and the war against uh, fascism. And also, of course, the New Deal and the civil rights movement downstream. Human suffrage, the principles of liberty and justice for all versus this notion of capitalism and versus free markets and everything else. What I'm revealing to you is that we're not any of that. We're not a democracy. We're not a capitalist structure. Yeah, now granted, money is being used in a very large way to make money. And if that's your definition of capitalism, okay. That's not the definition of capitalism. Capitalism is the means of production and distribution uh, in society of products by private ownership, by profit. But there are laws that mandate how certain things are brought to market. For example, cars. We don't sell cars where the brakes are sabotaged. We don't create airplanes where the planes are sabotaged. Although there are examples of both, but not in a mass way. But we have done that in other areas, but particularly in our financial industry.
And over the course of the last 13 to 15 years, we have completely perverted and distorted the whole aspect of everything. You already know that the law is not equal. We know that there's supposedly, you know, a lot of people say two levels of justice, but I, I'd say there's like probably 20, depending on how much legal representation you can afford. Or if you buy a corrupt politician and get him into the likes of the Supreme Court. But to kind of finish this up, what Patrick Lovell has figured out that nobody can touch or won't touch because they're too, if they're academics and they kind of skew towards a sort of anti-capitalism structure, and let's say they're Marxists and this and that, and they've got PhDs and they want to like, they want to blame capitalism. They don't know what's going on. They're thinking about it in terms of stuff that was written by Karl Marx in three, what, volumes of, you know, uh, uh, Capital, Das Capital. You know, they, in, in fact, from what I understand, and I've never read them all, I've just read excerpts, but, you know, uh, most people read just the first volume and they don't go all the way through the, vo the, the, the full series to understand exactly in, in the big picture. And so they take shortcuts as well, because it's a lot of information, right? But they don't understand that it's not capitalism because it's not capitalism because capitalism requires risk. Capitalism requires risk. There is no risk in what it is that I'm telling you. The system did exactly what Donald Trump is being accused of, that many of us think he's guilty of because he is guilty of it. We just haven't seen it lay out in the courts because the courts are corrupt, because we now know the Supreme Court's corrupt. We've always known, at least for the last probably two decades, that Congress is corrupt. But we didn't realize that our media was in on it, too. Our media basically is just telling the stories to create us all kind of like back and forth and like, oh my God, the world's falling and it's the end of democracy, but I don't know what democracy is or it's the end of free markets and I don't know what free markets are and tax policy and fairness, but I don't know what any of those things are. I don't know what the history of the United States is. I don't even know what, you know, constitutes the guy that I put in, you know, that, that's my senator or my representative. I don't know how many representatives I have for my state. I don't know how many senators I have for my state. I, how do I hold those guys accountable? I got to go to my job every single day to provide for my family, to get a roof over my head. Somebody else is supposed to do that. Except, no, the citizen is the ultimate backstop. Sorry, it takes work to understand your system. But of course I understand and I've got empathy that if you're working around the clock to jobs a piece to try to basically just barely make ends meet and everything's pulling you down, you don't have a lot of time to be able to kind of sort through really the levels of reality that would make you an informed citizen to be able to vote accordingly. And that's ultimately what we're looking at in this election cycle because of everything I just described about Trump, ultimately all the deception and the propaganda through Elon Musk, which I'm in complete you know, uh, conflict with. And I, and I hope that millions of you will elevate me to challenge Elon directly. Trust me, would I love to see him respond to some of the information that I have, not to mention could find, but in context of everything that I'm talking about. But the options are, at the moment, Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy Jr., who, of course, is supposedly representing this kind of like middle way that's not one of the duopoly in their terminology, where he's going to protect and re resurrect the middle class, which he's not because he doesn't understand the system. And oh, yeah, he's a ridiculous joke that shows cynically a billionaire as, as his VP candidate who wants to like talk about our garden most importantly or agriculture and that's cool and, and you know maybe yoga and maybe I'd like to go to a rave with her kind of thing but that's not somebody I see as a change maker for paradigm change based on understanding what corruption is because what was her rise to fame and power she slept and was married to um, you know uh, the gentleman who's the CEO and one of the co-founders of Sergey Brent of uh, Google Oh, yeah, she cheated on him with Elon Musk. <laughs> and that's who Bobby Kennedy chose as his VP because she could pay to help get him on all the ballots, of which it looks like the state of New York is not going to let him on the ballot because he lied about his place of residence. I don't know all the details of it, but they're blowing up on that. But Bobby Kennedy doesn't have a plan to deal with corruption as much as he says he does because he's a part of it. He's working for literally the same team that is the Steve Bannon you know, uh, Tucker Carlson, Alex Jones, 
you know, I, I don't want to put Joe Rogan in there right now because Joe Rogan really pissed off a lot of Trump guys because he's like, hey, man, you know, it seems like RFK Jr. is my guy because of the choices we have. And I would expect that from Joe Rogan. And and I can see why mil millions of people wouldn't want Kamala Harris because of all things related to the Obama administration where the world blew up and they lost their houses and their jobs and they're affiliating Miss Harris with that because they're right to because Miss Harris let let Steve Mnuchin get away with destroying hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Californians that are supposedly her constituents, the people that she represents, vulnerable African-American women and families that got destroyed by illegal doc, by illegal foreclosures using all the same methodologies that I just laid out that Trump is being indicted for and convicted of and would be convicted of more. But of course, the prosecutor chose not to prosecute because Steve Mnuchin is part of the club. He came out of Goldman Sachs. He was you know, put in place with a bunch of other billionaires to buy up and stabilize real estate that got the money through backdoor illegal uh, fire hose from the Federal Reserve that I am revealing, revealing to you that nobody else will. And who did Steve Mnuchin become? Steve Mnuchin became the treasury secretary for Donald Trump that would do the same exact thing that the Federal Reserve did under Holder and Obama to stabilize the global financial system because we've got fiat currency and we can blow trillions of dollars. But the way the actual dictates of the statutes of the way the methodology of the emergency stimulus program is, is not to A, be able to fund private uh, assets, but two, uh, that were created fraudulently that were worth nothing based on the collateral, which is what I'm revealing to you that was used with tens of millions of uh, felonies through falsification of business records and all sorts of lies in every single direction to get loans approved because that's the way control fraud works for the CEOs that are just monumentally bigger than Donald Trump. Donald Trump always wanted to be a part of the club. And so he and uh, the other victim of you know this this stuff to Putin back in the 90s because of what the smash and grab larceny was of you know the the tech and that's really really the algos of long term capital management is where all this stuff starts the quants they can they can trade really fast and they can put blow blow holes in uh, balance sheets of central banks because of volume based on fraud if you're gonna go big go really big. And so that's what this whole system's done. And so what our choices are, you know, are Donald Trump, the, the total criminal, the Joker, straight out of, I mean, not the cool Joker that we saw recently, uh, you know, through, uh, you know, uh, trying to remember the, the wonderful performance, the actor's name, Phoenix. No, that was his brother. Anyway, Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah, it was Joaquin Phoenix, not River Phoenix, Joaquin Phoenix. Anyway, um, it was the original. Uh, it was the original Joker. The one that we've known for like four decades, that guy, that's who Donald Trump is. Right. And uh, he's straight out of Gotham, man. He's been lying, stealing and deceiting his entire way. And the only reason he's running for president, as most of us know, is to stay out of prison. But it's also to create a fascist state which is what the white supremacists have wanted the whole time since going back to the loss of the Civil War and their treason with Hitler. It's really a miracle, quite frankly, knowing what I now know, that FDR was able to pull it off and the United States became what it became, but then it's always been something else. I mean, nothing is ever perfect, right? But it became this colossal mega corporate state that, you know, elections are really kind of a facade or they're a show trial they they're they're controlled they're controlled by this managerial class that gives us two choices and the other choice in this particular case is kamala harris who of course was the prosecutor who let steve mnuchin get away with all the stuff that she claims she's not letting that she didn't let him get away with but she did she did she said she took it to the bank she didn't take it to the bank she took payoffs. she didn't help homeowners she helped the state plug in gaps in, in, in the loss of tax revenue because of everything I lay out for you. And she played the game of Eric Holder, which got her the thumbs up to be able to follow Biden, who was a part of the whole thing, because we gave the government up to BlackRock back during the 2009 great financial crisis. And they've been pretty much running the show ever since, which is why you never saw the con. 
because they're the ultimate shareholders of all of the major companies uh, that we could have gotten the con on. And hopefully, you know, through media, people who wanted to understand the truth would have blown it up. But instead, all of media is owned by hedge funds or private equity funds anyway. They're all protecting the criminals, which got tens of trillions of dollars for free, backdoored illegally based on the information that I'm revealing to you. The statutes would never in a million years allow this to happen, nor would it be designed. Imagine the framers of the Constitution and anybody that were involved with the Federal Reserve back to Gla Carter Glass and how they you know, created these, these emergency stimulus programs to begin with. Hey, guys, let's create the situation where the entirety of our financial system is going to become a racketeering Ponzi scheme that's going to lie to uh, millions of people to basically set them up in a rug pool to steal their real estate that will eventually be worth nothing, that will sell around, sell around the world, that will bankrupt municipalities and countries and destroy millions of people around the world, probably north of 100 million people directly by the 2008 great financial crisis. And then what we're going to do is we're going to give those engineers that pulled all that stuff off, who broke the law in spades, we're going to give them tens of trillions of dollars. We're going to give them $33 trillion by 2009. Then we're going to pump another $16 trillion to buy all their toxic assets that they created to get them off the books so they can create more liquidity. Then we're going to create another $22 trillion during Steve Mnuchin's time when we passed Dodd-Frank regulation after the first emergency stimulus in 2009, where we said that, that this could never happen again, except that let's put the uh, the one caveat to that in the position of the Secretary of the Treasury, who was Steve Mnuchin, who, of course... Kamala allowed to get away with the crime of the century. That never ended. And they just basically continued moving forward. And then we had COVID and there were tens of trillions of dollars that came out of Federal Reserve Act 13.3 during Steve Mnuchin time into the CARES Act. It wasn't directly through Congress because Congress is a wet ends and nobody can get anything done in Congress. So the Federal Reserve just did the business of the economy of the billionaires while the people that we elect can't come to to terms and are owned by the same people that we let get away with monumentally skull fucking the United States. And then Biden did the same thing when he let Federal Reserve Act 13-3 plug holes with Jerome Powell, who is the uh, you know the the uh, chairman of the uh, Federal Reserve, who was appointed by um, by uh, Trump to basically backstop the biggest bankruptcies really in history, three of the biggest four bank bankruptcies that happened last year, including none other than Silicon Valley Bank, which a lot of money went to backstop Peter Thiel, the billionaire who is this like, what, homosexual uh, libertarian who basically is a super uh, corporate fascist that created the opportunity for um, J.D. Vance. And I'll finish off where I kind of started off. And J.D. Vance is this puppet to create further deep state stuff for the pseudo billionaires that are sucking out of the government largesse to ultimately destroy the rest of us. And JD Vance went on the tarmac to threaten Kamala. And that's where I came in at the beginning to stop that, to be able to give you guys this truth. Hey, I hope it makes sense onwards and upwards.